Thank you very much, Moshe. Uh, I have to say that this is uh, uh, a very unique experience for me uh, to be here at the Technion in a, in a session where the, where the Taub family is sitting. This is the uh, uh, first time that I've ever uh, done this before, and I think it's uh, these are two of the jewels in the crown, I think, of, of, of the Taub Center's uh, support in Israel. And it's, uh, it's a... It's an honor for me and a pleasure for me to be able to uh, to take part in uh, in this uh, cooperation between the Technion and the Taub Center. Um, what I would like to do today is to give you a long run, uh, a big picture perspective of Israel, where we were, where we are, where we're headed, how fast we're going there, what the implications of that are, and, uh, and, and an idea of what's underlying this. Uh, the time that I have certainly uh, is not a time for, for starting to solve all these problems, but I uh, need to point out from the outset that the picture is not a good one, but it is solvable. I, uh, I'm voting with my, with, with my own feet and my families. I mean, we're here. We think that there is a solution, and I think that uh, this institution that you're in is, is probably... Uh, one of the most important leaders in, in, in getting us uh, to, to solve these problems if we just have the political wherewithal to do it. But uh, uh, we have a, a number of gems here that uh, we need to utilize and we, need, we have a limited period to do so. Otherwise, uh, we're basically redefining right now <clears throat> what national security means. And uh, you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about in a moment. Israeli society is already in a much different place than it was uh, several years ago. Um, I think there is a recognition here, even though most people are only aware of the tip of the iceberg, that we are busily rearranging chairs on, on the Titanic. And there's an iceberg ahead of us that we need to deal with and we need to change course. Um, so I think that we'll get it right. I think we have time to get it right, but it's not a given. The, the default here is not a good one unless we get our act together. So I'd like to show you first uh, some of the big picture issues. One of them has to do with our standard of living, uh, and the other one has to do with the gaps in standards of living, the in income inequality in Israel and poverty, where we were and where we are, and how does how that compares to other countries, and what's behind it, and the importance of education. So that's the, that's the plan. I'll begin with the standard of living. We, we generally measure standards of living uh, as GDP per capita. Take the pi, GDP, divided by the number of, hour, of people in the country, and that's the average slice per person. How fast does that grow? That's the way most countries, or all countries, measure it officially, at least. Um, and in Israel, we have this tendency to think that uh, economic rules don't really apply to us. They kind of stop at the shores of the Mediterranean because we're special. You know, if you look at the uh, past uh, four decades, since 1973, for example, and, and, and want to see a growth path, is it in fact a path or is it just dots all over the place? Because during this period, we've undergone wars, triple-digit inflation, aliyah, immigration, to the tune of one-fifth of the population of the country in just half a decade. No normal country undergoes even one of these things. We've undergone them all, so do the rules of economics even apply uh, when all this craziness is going on? And, and the fact is that they do. And that's one of the problems that economists have, is to convince people that many of the things that they believe are just wrong. Uh, there's conventional wisdom, and then there are the facts. Okay, so I will start. Uh, I'm going to show you a few of these uh, today. But first of all, let's start off with, with a growth path. Is it a path? First of all, is, is our standard of living even rising? Well, before I show you the actual path, there is a positive trend. So things, in a sense, we are doing better than we have in the past. This is the trend line until 2000 and the extrapolation for the, for the past decade. How close to an actual line is our growth path, our actual growth path? And you can see that it's almost like a ruler. It's straight, okay? And that is very, very different than what most people think because what determines this path is not what most people consider important. That determines fluctuations. What determines the placement of the path and the slope of the path is something else entirely. It has to do with our national priorities. Specifically, it's called productivity, okay? And that's what I'm gonna focus on in a moment. What I want also to show you 
we're very happy in recent years that we're growing fast, okay? Well, the reason is that our big recession was not the West big recession. It was about a decade ago during the Intifada. Then we really tanked. And ever since, we've been growing fast. But all that happened is we're returning to normal. And that's got to be clear here. The problem is our normal. The problem is this entire track, which you can't see here. But you're going to understand that in a moment. So what determines growth? It's productivity. What determines productivity? It's innovation. Innovation, that's us. I mean, we're the startup nation, especially in this place. How could anybody argue with that, uh, with that contention? Well, are we really as good as we think? One way to measure, to gauge innovation, are patents. Not, it's not without its problems, but, but, and yet, it is one way to get a, a glimpse of it. So what are the number of patents by Israelis relative to country size, relative to GDP, and how do we compare with the leading Western countries, the G7 countries, that's the US, Canada, uh, England, France, Germany, Italy, and, and Japan? And you can see that there was a big gap a quarter of a century ago. Since then, the number of patents have increased at the rate of GDP in the leading countries. In Israel, we actually uh, reduced the gap between us. We were catching up until the mid-90s. And then an unusual thing happened. We actually overtook the leading countries in the West. We really are good in the innovation department. So what's the problem? If innovation determines productivity, what does our productivity look like? Well, one common measure, it's not the only one, but one common measure for productivity is called labor productivity. You take the pie, GDP, divide it instead of by the number of people, because not everybody works, and not by employees, because not everyone is full-time, but by the number of hours worked. So GDP per hour worked is, 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 is called labor productivity. How do we compare with the entire Western world? It's the family that's, uh, that belongs in the OECD. So this is all of the OECD countries. You have to wait a long time until you see Israel. Despite the fact that we're more innovative than nearly every one of these countries, we are way down there. The number, just so you understand, it means $34 an hour. In the United States, it's about $62 an hour. <clears throat> Not only is this bad, but look at the trend over the past four decades. If you look at productivity, labor productivity in the G7 in Israel, in 1970 there was a gap. Labor productivity rose at a fairly steady pace uh, over the next few decades. You can see it faltering in recent years. That's the big recession in the West. In our case, by the way, this is the reason that growth paths are steady, because they're dependent on productivity. Productivity grows at a steady pace. We were reducing the gap in the 50s and 60s. You can't see it here and in the early part of the 70s. And then a funny thing happened on our way to overcoming or catching up with the leading Western countries. Over the past four decades, we've been steadily falling farther and farther behind. This country, which is, has some of the best universities in the world, is cutting edge in so many fields, is falling farther and farther behind. This will end in tears. There is no happy ending to this graph if it continues. It's, not, it's in our hands to change it, but it's got to be clear, we don't have another four decades of this graph. Because what this graph means, essentially, is that while there are some people who will live in Israel no matter what, there are many that have a price. And the bigger the gap between what you can get abroad and what you can get here, we're crossing the threshold of more and more people who are going to decide to leave. And what we're talking about now is what this country is going to be and where our children are going to be. And for those of you who are from abroad, or whether your children are even going to care about this place or be proud of it. And that's what this is really about. So why is this happening? How can this be? The answer is that there are two Israels in one. There is the startup nation Israel, which is phenomenal. I mean, you here from the Technion don't need an explanation on what this phenomenal is. It is. But there's another Israel. And that other Israel is not getting either the tools or the conditions to work in a modern economy. That other Israel is huge. And that other part of Israel is getting, the share in the total is getting bigger. It's like a huge weight on our shoulders and literally pulling everything down. And it's been doing it for four decades straight. And it's more and more so over time. Now, to give you a sense of, of um, how severe the situation is, is it one outlier sector? Is it, is it the government? What, what's going on here? 
what we did this past year is, is looked at individual business sectors. And one of them is, is uh, manufacturing, which includes high tech, by the way. How do we compare since the mid 90s? And, and what I'm going to show you here are all the Western countries which we could find data for uh, since the mid 90s. Uh, what is their labor productivity in manufacturing and how does Israel compare to them? So these are the countries. This is us. That's manufacturing. If we look at uh, financial intermediation, banking and so on, this is what it looks like elsewhere. This is Israel. Trade, wholesale, retail trade and so on. This is what it looks like in the West. This is us. Construction. We're, we're basically using third world technologies to build buildings here in many cases. And, uh, and people are still wondering why Israelis don't want to work in construction. Well, if your productivity is low, think about it. If the amount you produce each hour is low, your wages can't be high. The opposite is true, by the way. It's possible to have high productivity and somebody will take the money. You won't get high wages. But a necessary condition for high wages is to have high productivity. If productivity is low, nobody's going to be able to give you high wages. In fact, the only place where we're not at the bottom is agriculture, where we're somewhere in the middle. Although among all of these different sectors, agriculture has the lowest uh, uh, productivity of all of them. So what's going on here? This is so robust a finding, it's so across the board in Israel, that it's really a fundamental infrastructure issue. One of the major infrastructures is the human capital infrastructure, education, and it's so important that I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on it. But it's not just, and we have to put it on the table, it's not just the, the, the human capital, it's also the physical capital infrastructure. And just to give you a glimpse of how they're related, on the horizontal axis, you have capital formation per hour and labor productivity on the vertical. And these are all of the OECD countries, and you can see the relationship here. It's a positive one. Israel, if you're looking for us, is way down on the left. You get what you pay for. Now, what does this mean, physical capital? One area, which is obviously important, is, is congestion on the roads. Okay, So if we look at uh, uh, one measure of this, which is the number of vehicles uh, per kilometer of road, uh, this is where Israel was in 1970. It's very important for me to show you the big picture because the fluctuations provide a lot of trees and, and people who look at what happens annually or even quarterly get confused by, uh, they, they miss the big picture. So this is like from 30,000 feet, where were we, where are we? And who were we like and who are we not like today? So this is where we were in 1970. If we take just the small Western European countries, Denmark, Belgium, Switzerland, Holland, the average, where, where were they 40 years ago compared to us? Identical. Identical. Now look what happened over the next four decades to congestion on the roads. All right? We're about three times as much, two and a half times as much. In fact, if we look at all of the OECD countries, and not just the smaller ones, road congestion is over three times uh, in Israel. It's over three times the Western average. Is it because we simply have more cars, more vehicles? And the answer is no. In fact, we have 40% less, 38% less vehicles. We have almost half the vehicles, three times the congestion, because somebody forgot to build roads and rail where most of the people live. Okay, now how is this related to productivity? Think about it this way. If you need to move stuff from point A to point B, and the roads are empty, and you need only 100 trucks and 100 drivers, and now the roads are three times as congested, if you need to, say, double the number of drivers, the driver is still moving the same stuff, but their productivity just fell by half. So not everything is high tech, but this cuts across the board here. It gives you some kind of an indication of the issues involved. Um, I'm going to talk about education, but I want to talk about it in the bigger context. So let's go to income inequality in Israel. What I'm going to show you now uh, is the gap between Israelis and the gap between individuals in other countries. This is called the Gini coefficient. The higher it is, the higher the income inequality. This is going as far back as we could find in, in the data for these various countries. This is disposable incomes, after taxes and after welfare. 
you can see that the United States has the highest income inequality. That's us, okay? Now, the official data includes it's East Jerusalem, which just makes it worse. But uh, we have this feeling in Israel that it's not really us, you know, the, the, the certain us, that it's, it's them, it's some other them, okay? Who are the, 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 I don't know if you saw the movie Casablanca, but, you know, who are the usual suspects? Okay, in Israel, it's the Arab Israelis, it's the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox. They're very poor. Uh, they must be, you know, behind this. They're such a big part of the population, it must be them. In fact, our own prime minister said, if you net them out, everything will look normal. Well, there are certain issues involved with netting people out of your population, but we'll put that aside for a moment. You can do it statistically, and we did, all right? So had the Jewish non-Haredi Israel been a separate nation, what would income inequality here look like? And how does it compare to other countries? We're doing ourselves not only a huge disfavor or a disservice, we're actually misleading ourselves because the gaps between us are among the highest in the Western world. The fact that we have these two huge populations that are very poor just aggravates an already bad situation but it's clearly not all focused there, and we need to start looking at the bigger picture here. Now, the, the primary jumping off point into the marketplace is education. And uh, when, we look about, when we look at education, we have uh, you know, comparisons to other countries, and these comparisons are given every few years, these exams, international exams in math, science, and, and oftentimes in reading as well. How do we compare? Well, every time the, one of these exams is given, uh, we do fairly poorly. I'm going to show you how poorly in a moment, but that's not what I'm going to show you here. Not the mean. By the way, those of you who come from the United States probably know what I'm talking about as well, because every time that one of these exams is published, there's a big outcry, what's happening with our education? Well, I've got news for you. You don't even see us in the rearview mirror. That's how far behind we are. Okay, despite having an institution like this one and more, more like it. But what I want to show you is not the mean, but the standard deviation in these exams, the gap in educational achievements within Israel, and how does it compare with the, the 25 relevant Western countries. So, beginning in 1999, only 14 of these countries participated. First place is not where you get a gold medal. Okay, it means that our educational inequality was the highest. I should point out that the Haredi kids, most of, nearly all of them don't study the material. They don't take the exam. We can't blame them for this. In fact, it would be a lot worse if they did take the exam, but we did this on our own. And every single exam since then, every single international exam, we have the highest educational inequality. And if you have the highest educational inequality, don't be surprised afterwards when it, it's translated to high income inequality. We have a fundamental problem here that we need to start uh, tackling and dealing with. Now, in fact, if we were to focus just on the middle class, and there is no formal definition of a middle class, okay? But if we take out the, the, the wealthier Israelis, the top 25%, and we take out the poor Israelis, the bottom 25%, and look just at the middle. What is the gap between a person who is at the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile? What is the income gap between them in Israel? How does it compare to the gap in other countries? And you can see that the gap within our middle class is higher than elsewhere in the Western world. So this is, this is a problem, just like the productivity. It cuts across groups, okay? It's a fundamental problem, and we need to tackle it at its source. And, and that's where we, we start having some issues. So I showed you productivity. Now let's start narrowing things down a bit. Talk about employment. I'm going to show you men. I could also show you women. By the way, I should point out, if this stuff interests you, nearly everything I'm showing is, is in this booklet um, that we put out. It's like one picture per page, a little bit of an explanation. And there's a lot more than what I'm showing you here. And if you're interested in previous versions, which shows some of this, what I'm showing you here, that's, it's all available on the Taub Center website. So you're welcome to, to look at it. So I'm not going to show you females because there, while we have a major problem of employment uh, among Arab Israeli women and Haredi women, 
Jewish non-Haredi woman works so much more than in the West, and on average we look okay, all right? So I'm going to show you men because that's where the problem is, always. Uh, so if we look at prime working age men, 35 to 54 years old, all right? Um, in the G7 and in Israel, 40 years ago, in 1970, they worked. Nearly everybody was employed, almost everyone, 95%, nearly 95%. Now, if I was just to show you that it fell in Israel, it's not a big revelation because we know that all over the Western world, employment rates for men were very high decades ago, and for women they were very low. And one of the things that happened is a convergence over time. Women work more, men work less. So just to show you that it fell, eh. So let me show you the benchmark, okay? If we look at the G7 countries, you can see the decline in employment. It stopped roughly in the mid-90s, okay? And then it evened off. And then at the end here, this is the big recession, okay? So that's what happened in, in the G7 countries. Now look what happened here. Okay, so there, th we're falling farther behind, though there are two negative bubbles that need an explanation, one and two. The first one, you can see, and uh, those of you familiar with our history, that's when we had the huge influx of immigrants, don't know the language, so clearly employment's going to drop. This part is actually a, nothing less than a miracle, the, the way we absorbed them with all of the mess that was involved, but still we absorbed them extremely quickly. Employment rates rose, but not to Western levels, to this declining trend. The next negative bubble, this is where, where we tanked. I showed you the growth. This is, this is the intifada. This is, this is our big recession. Okay? And ever since, we've been coming out of it. Here's the point. We're in one of our best years, or our best years in a decade. The West is one, in one of its worst periods in 80 years, since the 1930s. Look at the gap between us now and look where it was. Okay? There is a problem here of men working. And those who do work, when you look at the productivity, that's also falling behind. So what's the problem? Let's relate it to education. The reason is that as economies develop, we need, we basically go in the case of Israel from an agrarian country to, to light industry, textiles and so on, to heavier industry services and so on. Which is a fancy way of saying that the demand for educated individuals is rising all the time and the demand for uneducated, unskilled individuals is falling. It's falling in relative terms because the population is increasing. I want to show you what I'm talking about because uh, there are a lot of people who live off of anecdotes and say, well, I got a college education, I can't find a job. Well, you may not find the job you want, but you can find a job. There are actually people who cannot find any job, okay? And that's a little bit of a different problem. So we're sticking with prime working age men, 35 to 54 year olds. Let's start with the least educated, those without more than four years of education. 40 years ago, 40 plus years ago, they worked. Over 90% were employed. Now keep in mind how many 35 to 54 year olds never made it to fifth grade today, okay? So the supply has shrunk considerably. But the demand for such individuals, that's almost evaporated. So this is what their employment rates look like. And in fact, if you divide up all of the men into all of the different groups, this is what's transpired over the past four decades. Forty years ago, this was, this was somewhere in transition between a developing country and a developed country, but we certainly weren't a developed country. Everyone could find a job. It didn't matter if you were educated or not. On the right, this is what a modern country looks like. Every modern country, the numbers may change, but the lower your education level, the lower your chances of being employed, and it's going to get worse. There should not be any doubt about that. Now, Haredim are not on this graph, by the way, because the Haredi boys study a core curriculum only through eighth grade. And even that core curriculum isn't a normal core curriculum. There's no science, there's no English, very rudimentary math. So if they study 30 years or 40 years, and most of it's in yeshiva, where do we do them? Where do we put them here? Okay, so if we lump all of the Haredi men together, when, there, there are two main questions here. First question is, what's the issue with Israeli Haredi? 
And they work in America, they work in England, they work in France. What's, what's the problem with our Haredim? How come they don't work? And, and if you ask Haredim here, or you ask non-Haredim Israelis, the answer is pretty much the same. Well, we've gotten used to it. You've let us do it. We let them do it. They got used to it. That's the way it's been. That's the way it's always going to be. It's a cultural issue. There's nothing we can do about it. Well, it turns out that's not exactly true. That's what we think. But even in Israel, three decades ago, the Haredi worked. Over 80% were employed. We're misleading ourselves about this cultural business. Okay? Second question is, what is the value of their education? Okay, now some of them go through the Technion's Mechina, and some of them make it elsewhere too. And we're going to talk a little bit about Haredim. But in general, if we're going to plot 35 to 54-year-old Haredim men with the education that they receive, who are they most similar to? Who do they fall closer to? Because they're not illiterate. They study something. So who are they closest to? Well, it turns out that this maps in identically almost over the past three decades to people with no education at all. Because the value of what we gave them three and a half, four decades ago was sufficient for the kind of economy that we were. But Israel's a modern economy today and becoming more and more competitive as we go. And the education that we give them is increasingly less sufficient for working in a modern economy. Now, there have been a lot of stories in recent years about the increase in employment among Haredim, and you can see it in the, in the graph here. But in fact, there was an increase in employment for, for nearly everyone. You saw it in the previous graph as well, because we're coming out of our recession, so we don't have the counterfactual year, what would have happened otherwise? Now, when we talk about uh, uh, education and its importance on employment, let's put the Haredim aside for a moment. How does it affect Arab Israelis, and how does it affect Jewish Israelis? How does it affect women? How does it affect men? All right, so no Haredim on this graph. Sticking with prime working age individuals. If we start with uneducated Arab women, okay, those who didn't finish more than 11 years of schooling, what are their employment rates? In fact, only one in 10 works or is employed. If we looked at uneducated Jewish women, again, no Haredim here. It's better, but nothing to write home about. A little bit better for Arab men. Un these are all uneducated, never finished high school. In fact, never made it to 12th grade. So this is roughly about two-thirds. Now, if we go to the other end of the spectrum, what are the employment rates of individuals with an academic education? Any academic education. And, and, I, and I should be very clear that it really makes a big difference where you go to school and what you study, and I'm totally ignoring that right now. Just put a V if you got any kind of a degree as a first brush. I mean, we have in, in, the, in the data what it means elsewhere too, but just what does it mean in terms of employment? We we'll start with Jewish men. About 90% are employed, those who have an academic education of some sort. For Arab uh, Israeli men, roughly the same. Jewish women, also fairly similar. Check out the Arab women. Okay, so it's not identical. I mean, it's still lower. We haven't solved all of the problems in Israel, but when we say Arab women don't work, it's another way of saying the group that's uneducated is huge compared to the one that is educated. Okay, and that's where the primary difference is. Now, having said that, it does matter where you go to school and what you study, because that's going to be reflected in the type of work you do and the kind of wages you have. Okay, so we do have that information. But, but again, as a first brush, you can see here the importance of, of simply getting an education. Now, I've been focusing until now on the quantitative, like how many years of education. The quality of education is clearly important. So I showed you the gaps within Israel between our kids. The most recent exam was a PISA exam given in 212. And I'm going to show you the mean, where we are compared to these 25 other OECD countries. Keep in mind, this does not include the Haredim. So they didn't take the exam because they don't study the material. And yet, there we are, at nearly at the bottom. This is an improvement, I want you to know. In general, we've been at the bottom. Uh, okay, so poor Slovakia. But uh, uh, again, if this would include Haredim, we would be way at the bottom. 
the Jewish non-Haredi children, the Hebrew-speaking non-Haredi kids, actually had an improvement here, though there are, there are major questions on how we actually attained that improvement, but I'll skip that. What kind of an education do we give the Arab-speaking children in Israel? It's, uh, it's below many third world countries, okay? Below our neighbors, Jordan, for example. The Jordanian kids do better than Arab-Israeli kids in math, science, and reading. So when, when we're talking about these issues looking forward, if we're giving our kids a third world education, how can they possibly sustain a first world economy, okay? More on that in a moment. One of the new findings that we have, it's not yet in any of our publications, it was just uh, published uh, a few weeks ago, uh, problem-solving abilities, okay? In, in other words, going down one level, not how much math do they know and can they, uh, do they know science, problem-solving, which I have no idea how to define, so I'll just read you what, how the OECD defines it and then you'll get a glimpse of how we're preparing our kids. There are six levels of problem-solving ability defined by the OECD, from the highest level six to the lowest level one. In general, students at level one can solve straightforward problems provided that there is only a simple condition to be satisfied and there are only one or two steps to be performed to reach that goal. In contrast to students proficient at level two, level one students tend not to be able to plan ahead or to set sub-goals. That's level one. I'm not gonna show you level one. I'm gonna show you the share of kids in each of these countries that don't even reach level one. Okay, this is the future, and they're in our classrooms right now, okay? And if we don't reach them in the next few days, basically, when they grow up, what are they gonna do? Who's gonna, who's gonna handle this place? Who's gonna run it? Uh, how is it gonna be able to be run? Who's even thinking about that or dealing with it? Uh, now, a little bit about the demographics. This is this past year in elementary school where the average for these kids is below third world countries and these kids aren't even studying the material. That's almost half the children in Israel. All right? If we look at the enrollment, just in the past 13 years, from the year 2000 till the year 2013, in the non-religious schools, in the Mamlakhti, the state schools, a 6% increase over 13 years. In the religious schools, not the Haredi schools, but the religious schools, 19%. In the Arabic-speaking schools, a 40% increase, and this is in 13 years in the, in the Haredi schools. This is our future. And if we don't reach these kids and give them the best education that we're capable of giving because we have some of the best universities in the world, but if we don't reach them tomorrow morning, when they grow up, we lose the country. There should be no doubt about it, where we're headed and what this is all about and what's at stake here. Now, we see some changes. Okay, and one of the things that we focused on in our most recent uh, the State of the Nation report at the Taub Center was on Haridim. We, we basically just dove in and, and we looked at Haridim in a totally different way, a seminal study, by looking at, at, at neighborhood levels. Okay, so I'm going to show you a little bit about Haridim, but I'm going to show you a little bit in general about four major portions of Israeli society and academic attainment. Again, putting just a V here, if you have a degree, not going into the question, is that degree worth much? Okay, but I just, this is, this is from the census. So it's a little bit dated, it's 2008, um, but it'll give you a sense of, of the direction here. In most cases, the direction is good, but there are some things that con contradict conventional wisdom, let's just say. So let's start off with Haredi Jews. I'm gonna compare older, 45 to 64 year olds to younger in terms of attainment of education degrees and men versus women. So among the older non-Haredi Jews, this is the big bulk of Israeli society, no difference between men and women, 31% have some kind of an academic degree. Of the younger ones, 25 to 44 year olds, you can see almost no change for the men, a very big change for the woman, an improvement. And we see that all over the Western world, in fact, that, w that women are studying now more, and uh, this is good. Christian Arab Israelis, the older ones, less than the Jews, more for the men than for the women, 
But look what happened for the younger ones. A, a complete turnaround. More for the men, but look what happened for the women. It's more than double. In fact, the, the share... The share with an academic degree is more than for, for Jewish men today in Israel. So this is, this is a major turn in the, in the right direction, although this population group is very, very small. Muslims and Jews, the, the, the data is very similar. Among the older ones, this is what it looks like, much more for men than for women, but in both cases, very, very low rates of academic attainment. For the younger ones, a big turnaround for the women. No change for the men, but a huge turnaround for the women. This is great. It's still very small. I mean, keep, it, keep it in proportion here. But it is a massive turnaround, and it's very important to point out. Now, Haredim. This is what it looks like for the older Haredim. Now, in fact, we're inundated, I mean, just bombarded for the past few years with news stories about more and more Haredim getting an academic education. And it's true, and it's great. And they come here. They go to other universities, they go to other academic institutions. Fantastic. There are a lot more Haredim getting an academic education. What we don't see stories about are, there are simply a lot more Haredim. So, what's happening in general in the society, okay? We don't see stories, I mean, reporters aren't following those who choose not to go to higher education. So what's happening? How does the older compare to the younger? And here, again, it's confounding all of the conventional wisdom. The direction is exactly the opposite of everything we're basing our policies on, that there's an improvement here. It's not. The share of, of Haredi men, the younger ones, with an academic education is just half of the older ones. And for the women, where they're the, big, the biggest strides, it's a third less. Now, again, this is dated. This is 2008. So one can say, well, most of this has been happening more recently. We must be on the right track. Now, we actually, to be honest with you, didn't believe the data. This, is, so, this can't be. I mean, it's just, it's just too off. And uh, so we decided to corroborate it. Now, it's really difficult to corroborate data on Haredim in Israel because there is no data almost at all on Haredim in Israel. Uh, but there is one small survey, relatively small survey, called the Social Survey, which does have Haredim. So there, it's a much smaller sample. It's going to be a lot of fluctuation. But here you're going to be able to see how things developed over time through 2012. So just focus here on Haredi men. Again, prime working age. What share of these men have an academic degree of any kind? And, and you can see it's basically not going anywhere. It's, it's fluctuating, but it's very low. This graph is supposed to focus on 35 to 54-year-olds, but one of the things I've learned over the past few months of showing this graph is, yeah, but the changes with the younger ones. So let's go outside the graph for a moment. For 20 to 34-year-olds, the situation is actually worse. If we look at what share, again, returning to the prime working age, 35, 54, what have, who finished high school have a matriculation? Very low, not going anywhere. In fact, the largest group of Haredi men are those who never made it beyond eighth grade in terms of a formal education. That group is not only the biggest, it's the, it's the one that's growing. It was 31% a decade ago, and it's almost half today. And that's what's underlying, basically, some of these primary processes that we see, and that's not on anybody's radar when we're dealing with these groups here. And, and it's something that we need to take into account. What are they studying? Well, again, if, if we, we break up into the different age group, what share uh, of men in the different age group ever in their lives studied in, in a higher yeshiva, you can see the negative relationship here. The older the men, in, in this case 75 and up, only about half of them ever studied in yeshiva because they weren't, and they studied other stuff. The, the younger you go, the bigger the group. It goes up to 90% uh, in that regard. Yeah. Okay, so I can't leave you like that, right? I warned you in advance that we have some problems here. But the fact is, I don't think that all is lost, okay? Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. And uh, I want to show you the bright side because I think it's a very important bright side. First of all, the knowledge is in Israel. We have to make it clear this is by no stretch of the imagination yet a third world country. Okay, we have some of the best universities in the world. In fact, a study from right here in the Technion, Uri Kirsch. Okay, if you look at the academic ranking of Israel, of countries, 
uh, and how Israel compares to them in, in the various fields. You can see that in computer science over the past decade, we were in second place in the world. Economics, my field, sixth place. Just so you know, uh, it's a reduction. We were actually, once upon a time, number one. Overall, 10, which is high, which is good. It means that the knowledge is here. Uh, one other thing, important thing, that we have going for us at the top of the pinnacle here, too. If we look at, forget the more political Nobel Prizes, okay, uh, the Peace Prize or the Literature Prize, but if we focus on the sciences, there have, in fact, been six Israelis that have gotten prizes in the science. I'm not even including the two from last year who did most of their work abroad and they live abroad. Um, there are only four countries in the entire world with more, okay? And uh, in fact, this isn't even controlling for country size because if we did, it would be more accurate. Besides, we look a lot better, which is the whole point of this exercise, okay? <laughs> We're off the charts in that regard. Money is flowing into Israel. Foreign direct investment, $600 million in 1993, almost $6 billion in 2000, and over $10 billion in 2012. This isn't charity. These aren't donations. This isn't philanthropic. This is hard-nosed business people making investments here because they know we're really good. If you look at venture capital investments relative to, to GDP, to country size, this is the OECD countries, and this is Israel. We have the knowledge, we have the recognition in the world that we're one of the most important and best places to invest in, so money is flowing here. This is our window of opportunity. So last slide and then questions or however you want to proceed. Fertility, okay, the West is growing old. You need 2.1 kids per family to maintain the same population over time. The average in the developed world is 1.8. And in fact, the countries on the left, are not, we're not the only ones who have to start thinking about the future. Those countries on the left have to decide who's going to be paying Social Security to maintain uh, basically living standards for the elderly, who's going to be taking care of them, who's going to be working. So they're, in, they're basically uh, importing many of the problems that we already have. This is us. No problem in the kids' department. Tons and tons of kids, okay? The question is, what are we going to do with these children? Are, are we going to give them the knowledge that's already here, that's here, here physically in this place and in some of the other institutions around Israel? Are we going to reach these kids in time? Because if we don't, there is this demographic, democratic point of no return. Things that we can do today in the Knesset, we can find a majority to change direction in this Knesset, probably in the next Knesset, the next few. At some point, that's not going to be possible anymore. And at that point, after that point, it's just, that's the definition of point of no return. Do the math. Now, there's this other thing going for us and going against us, which you need to keep in mind. In these exams, on internationally, 40% of the eighth grade students had high self-confidence in learning math. The, it ranged from a low of 17% among the Japanese. I don't know if you noticed, but they actually know the material to a high of 59% in Israel, we're so overconfident, we don't even recognize that we don't understand the material. Okay, now, the, 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 the obvious drawbacks are that we're supremely overconfident. Uh, we, we're, you know, the bright side is we're not afraid of failure. The downside is we don't even bother to learn from failures. Uh, but, but, but here, you know, putting, putting the, the, the humor aside for a second, we're literally not afraid of anything. This is not something you can teach. So imagine if that 3.0 actually had the knowledge to go with the confidence they already have in themselves, the sky's the limit in a world that's growing old. Okay, and, and that's, what, that's the challenge that we have, to get with the program here, get this knowledge to the kids as soon as possible. If we do, we'll be fine. If we don't, we lose the country. Thank you. <laughs>